That irrigation is such a such an important issue. Um, I always I always like to I really really do like to educate people about irrigation because. You know, what, what we do in treating lawns, our, our business is, is, you know, fertilizing and weed control and, and things like that, chemical application to, to, to treat lawns, but if the irrigation isn't right, then what we do doesn't make, doesn't do, doesn't do its job. So what I like to do is I like to really stress how important it is for proper irrigation to take place. And, and educate you guys so that you know how, what to look for and how to adjust your sprinkler heads and you know, what kind of irrigation systems, you know, how, how they work and just, just so that you can, be, you can have the knowledge that you need to keep the irrigation um, on the lawn and, and uh, keep, it, keep it healthy because the irrigation actually is the foundation. You know, like I said, if, if the irrigation isn't right, nothing else is gonna be right. So you can, you can fertilize, you can do all that other kind of stuff, but if, if the irrigation isn't, isn't there, uh, you know, or, or isn't working properly, or isn't, there isn't enough irrigation, then nothing else is really gonna matter. So uh, let me just introduce myself for those of you who don't know me, I'm Skip Orth, and I'm the owner of Father and Son Pest and Lawn Solutions. Um, we've been in business here in Navarre since 2003. I started with who was then my teenage son. He was 13 years old. Um, his name is Buddy. And we just started it as, hey, how you doing? Come on in and, and take a seat anywhere. Um, we just started it kind of as a father-son lawn mowing business and it just kind of developed from there into what we're doing now in, in treating lawns and, and keeping them healthy. Um, but he went into the Army in 2009, spent six years there, and then came back uh, and started working with me again, and he, he currently does uh, most of our, our sales and uh, customer contacts, so um, that's kind of our, our history in a nutshell. Let me just point out a couple resources for you that we have. Um, I do have a, um, a DVD here if you, if you want to take these, there's no charge. Um, this is a DVD of a, uh, a lawn workshop I did talking not about irrigation, but basically, you know, fertilization, weed control, insect disease control, you know, everything that you need to do to keep your lawn healthy in addition to irrigation. So if you'd like one of those DVDs, please um, help yourself. I also have uh, my book here, um, What Every Homeowner on the Emerald Coast Needs to Know About Lawn Care. Um, the Emerald Coast is a very, very unique place to try to grow a lawn. Um, if you've been here for any length of time and tried to keep your lawn healthy, you know that it's, it's a lot harder here than it is elsewhere, most any other place in the country. I mean, you can go 50 miles north of here and it's a lot easier than it is right here along the Emerald Coast. And there's a lot of things that we have to do differently in this area than you have to do say, you know, just a, a little ways north of here or even, you know, um, in, in the Midwest or, or whatever. So um, I've got this book. It just is uh, a lot of information and, and tips on how to keep your lawn healthy right here along the Emerald Coast. Um, What's this cost? What does it cost? Yeah. Free. Just take it. You know, if, if you want one, just, just help yourself. Um, there's no charge for, for those books. Uh, if... Um, if, if you would like a magnet for your car, what we do is we have um, a deal where if you get spotted uh, with your magnet out while you're driving around, uh, we'll make a post on Facebook and you could win $100. So feel free to take a magnet if you'd like. Um, we have business cards here. And finally, if you're having trouble with your lawn, if you'd like us to come out and take a look at it. now. I'd like to clarify this is an irrigation workshop. We don't do irrigation work. However, we can tell you whether you have an irrigation problem or not and refer you to somebody or we have a, a number of people that we refer that actually do irrigation work and that can help you if, if you need help with that or we can tell you anything else that's going on with your lawn that, you know, any other reason why you, you might be having problems with it. 
So um, you would just uh, mark, yes, I would like a free lawn consultation, fill out your information here, and we'll call you and set up an appointment to uh, come out and, and take a look at your lawn uh, with you. Uh, just a couple other things. What we're going to do is we'll, I'll, I'll talk for about 45 minutes or so. We'll take a, about a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back together and finish up for the, for the second hour. As we're going through, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, just raise your hand because a lot of times we can, you know, uh, just add to what I'm already saying with, with any questions that you may have. Um, there's, there's coffee and cookies and water in the back. Um, restrooms are right at that door down the hall to the left and then to the right there are signs there if you need to use the restroom. So. That being said, um, I've got a little cheat, cheat sheet here. I'm going to make sure that um, I want everything I want to cover here. So, first of all, you know, I, I just I I asked a few minutes ago um, how many people were were recently moved here, and most everybody raised their hand, which I, I you know totally makes sense because most other places in the nation don't have you don't have irrigation systems. I mean, they, they just, they, they're, they're not needed or, or they're just not available. You know, the water is not available. So here in Northwest Florida, it's one of the hardest places to grow grass because our soil is um, coarse. It doesn't hold water. Uh, it has very little nutrition in it. We have a lot of insect pests that will attack the grass. Um, grass does not naturally grow here. We have diseases, yada, yada, yada. You know, so it's really hard to grow grass. However, Mother Nature did provide us a little bit of help by giving us this thing called the aquifer. And again, this is a very unique, unique thing that we have right here in, in North Florida and other parts of Florida. And basically what the aquifer is, is it's a network of underground lakes and streams that originates somewhere way, way up the East Coast in the mountains and underground streams flow all the way from the Northeast and, and pool down here in our region. Nobody knows exactly where they uh, originate from, but they, they know it's somewhere up there. So we have this incredible resource called the aquifer that we can actually tap into and it gives us a little bit of help in keeping our lawns nice because if we didn't have irrigation here it would just be nearly impossible to grow a lawn um, and there's a couple reasons for that number one is is that as i as i've mentioned the soil here is mostly sand it's very coarse it has very little water holding capabilities at all if I'm sure you've noticed if we get a heavy downpour, most areas, unless the water table is really high, the water will just seep out and be gone within hours after a heavy downpour. Um, the the um, other reason is, is that our, our weather patterns are unpredictable. Um, we don't have, like, um, I have some relatives that live in South Florida in South Florida, you can almost predict every afternoon there's going to be a little rain shower. You know, it's just going to pop up about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, boom, rain for 15 minutes, and, and be over with. That's very common. Here, we can go weeks and weeks and weeks, which we just did recently, without any rain. And so if we have soil that is coarse and doesn't hold water and we go for weeks without rain, there's no way that that grass is going to survive without supplemental watering. And that's why we need irrigation systems. We have to have irrigation. Um, so what exactly is an irrigation system supposed to do? You know, is it a is it a crutch for your lawn or, or, or what? Because, again, I, I, you know, I mean, I've, I'm sure everybody has noticed all the new construction going on in the area. I mean, there's houses popping, new houses popping up in every neighborhood. 
And in my neighborhood, there's a lot of construction going on. And what I'll notice is certain new houses, they'll, they'll build them, people will move in, and they are running their irrigation system, it seems like, all the time. I mean, morning and afternoon, every single day, just watering, watering, watering. And it's, it's like almost, um, uh, you know, there, you, you, you don't, the, let me just say that the, uh, the irrigation system is not supposed to be a crutch to prop your lawn up. What your irrigation system actually is, is it's a safety net to keep the lawn out of drought stress. Okay, and that's the way you need to use it. You don't need to use it every day regardless, no matter what. Um, and here's the reason why, is that as the, as the soil begins to dry out in between either irrigation events or rain events, what that does is that stimulates root growth in the grass. So as, as the soil begins to dry out, that sends a signal to the grass saying, hey, you need to increase your root structure so that you can, when, when dry times come, you'll be able to pull more moisture out of the soil. So the grass therefore starts to grow, um, to, to, to grow more roots. So if you have an irrigation system, the best way to use it is when you notice drought stress in your lawn. Now, how can you tell if the lawn is drought stressed or not? Um, there's a couple ways that are fairly easy to tell. Um, one of the easiest ways, I think, to tell if, if an area, say you have an area of the lawn that look, looks like it might be dry, um, looks like mm, maybe it's not getting enough water. How do I know for sure? Well, if you look, if you if you pluck an individual blade of grass and kind of look at it long ways, like you're sighting down the barrel of a gun, if the grass has plenty of, if if it's well hydrated, the blade will have a slight V to it. It'll it'll be mostly open, but as that grass begins to dry out that V will, be able, will begin to close because the grass is trying to conserve its water. So it'll close. So if, if, that, if the grass blade is folded together, that grass is, is right on the verge of drought stress. Um, a, couple other, a couple other ways to uh, recognize drought stress in the lawn is it, it, it kind of it takes on like a bluish color, almost a light, light green or bluish color. Uh, another thing is, is the grass is not resilient. So if you step on the grass and then step back, you're, the grass will not spring back and you'll be able to actually see your footprint. So those are some, those are some things that, uh, those are some things to look for to tell if the if the grass is actually going into, if the lawn is actually going into drought stress or not. Now, it's very likely, if you, if you are running your irrigation system and we go into a drought, it's very likely that you'll see some areas of drought stress in some parts of the lawn and not in others. Um, and here's the reason why, is because there is no building standard or county standard or whatever, at least in Santa Rosa County, for irrigation systems. So if a builder builds a new house and talks to a landscaper and says, okay, I want you to give me an irrigation system for this house and I want you to sod it and put in the land, you know, plants and everything, well, there is no code to determine how many heads per zone or how, how much water needs to cover each area or whatever. That's all up to the landscaper or the person that installs the system. So you could have a house, you could have two brand new houses and one house has 30 irrigation heads in it and another house has 20 irrigation heads in it. And they're both the same size lot. It just really comes down to how much money did the builder allow 
Well, two things actually. How much money did the builder allow for the irrigation system or how skilled was the landscaper at installing an irrigation system that provided even coverage over the whole lawn? You know, those are the two issues. And I can, I can tell you from experience and looking at hundreds, literally hundreds of lawns that I've seen very few lawns that have irrigation systems that do a good job at covering the entire lawn. So let me kind of just give you an overview of what, what a, 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 a typical irrigation system should look like, okay? And just, just for simplicity's sake, we'll say that we have a square lawn um, and if we want to cover, um, if we want to make sure that this lawn has enough water, how would we do that? Well, we could go to an irrigation or, or a landscape architect and have him design a perfect system that would distribute the exact amount of water over the whole lawn that would be perfect. And we would pay several thousand dollars for him to do that. It's not really necessary. What we want, really what we want, is we want to make sure that we have enough water over the whole lawn to keep everything healthy. It's okay if some of it gets more than others, but we want at least enough over the whole lawn to make sure everything stays nice and green and well hydrated. So typically what we would do to cover something like this, we would want to have the sprinklers overlapping one another. So if we had a sprinkler head here in the corner, and it was covering this area, then we would want another sprinkler head here that would be covering that area. And we would want, and if this sprinkler head was covering this area, we would want another sprinkler head that would be covering that area. So we would have overlap on all of our heads. Okay, that's, let me, let, I'm not going to get any more technical than that other than if you just remember overlap, okay? If, you're, if your sprinkler heads overlap, at least two of them overlapping coverage, then that's good. If they're, if they're set up to where they're like this and they're just, they're, the, the sprays are touching one another but they're not overlapping, that's not good. That's not going to put out enough water in the amount of time that you're running the system for it to hydrate the soil enough to, to uh, keep the grass out of drought stress. Okay? Um, any questions at this point? Did you already say the name of the best sprinkler person in the area that you recommend? <laughs> no, get with me at the end and I'll, I'll, and it depends if you want, if you, if you want, if you need repair, I have some people that do repair and if you need a whole system installed, I know some, some people that will install whole systems. So your guy on the card said he recommended a sprinkler or irrigation audit. Right. So okay. So we've got an existing system, that means somebody comes in and tells us. Yeah. I have a, I have someone that can do that for you. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> let me just, let me give you, okay, again, let's go back to our yard here and again, give you another, just another concept to think about. Okay. This is just information for you to be aware of. Okay. So if I have a sprinkler head here and I have it set to do a 180, and I have a sprinkler head here, and it's set to do a, a 90 degree. And let's say I have a sprinkler head here, and it's doing a 360. And they're all in the same zone. So they're all, say this is running for 30 minutes or whatever time. This 
area right here is going to get twice the amount of water as this area right here because the area it's covering is half the size. Okay, this area, since this is doing a 360, it's going to get one quarter the amount of water that's covering than this right here because it's doing a 360 rather than a 90. So what, what I've seen a lot of times, especially in Holly by the Sea Yards, is they'll have out, out by the road, the first 20 feet from the road in 20 feet is never healthy. And the reason is, is because, let's say the road is right here, they'll have sprinkler, system, they'll have sprinkler heads here and they'll be doing 360s like this, and then they'll have heads back here that are doing 180s. So out by the road here is getting, getting, if these are overlapping, this is getting one quarter the amount of water that this is getting back here. This area right here would be doing, you know, would be getting all, plenty of water, whereas this area out here by the road would be getting very little water. Yes? How much should be considered the slope of the yard? And that's, that's another issue. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. The slope of the yard will actually make a difference too because if, if, you have a, if you have a yard that slopes and you have a sprinkler head right here, the sprinkler head is designed these heads are designed under the, under the correct pressure to throw 30 feet. So if you have it throwing 30 feet this way, that's the distance from here to here is going to be more than if it were flat throwing 30 feet that way. So you're actually, again, you're getting less water coverage because the yard slopes because it's actually covering a greater distance. Does runoff assist the lower end of the yard? That was my question as well because in the lower area, our grass is beautifully green mm -hmm. and it's drought stressed up on the higher mm -hmm. end. So yeah, so, and that's, that's, that is another, another factor is, you know, yeah, some of that water that falls here is gonna run down here like this. Um, what you would, what, depending on the distance, you know, you may, th there would be a couple possible solutions to that. One possible solution would be to put in another row of, of heads um, or, or, or put, in, um, put in another row, shorten this up to where it just falls right here and then have another row. Or there's a way that you can increase the amount of water coming out of the head and just soak this area more. Um, and I'll, I'll go over that in a few minutes on, on how, how, we're gonna, how we can do that. Yes? You mentioned that the head for the overlapping is in a circle. Okay. If you have a square lot, is it better to put a, a semicircle one at each end here to go this way rather than putting it at the top, come down that, you know what I mean? A is it shape rather than a circular at the very edge of the lot to go like that? Um, it really, it doesn't matter whether, are you talking about, is it better for it to do a 90 than a 180? Well, if you've got a square lot, you know I mean? Yeah. You don't, don't worry about the overlap because you've got to go from there to there and overlap from the middle with the circle one, you know? That's what I've got, I mean, in the problem area, all about the seat. Uh -huh. The sprinkler heads are at the edge of the, of the property. Yeah. They go supposedly half circle. Right. But there's also in the middle where they go full circle. Okay. That would give a good overlap on the micro there. Yeah, it would. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That that would be, you know, that that would be a good setup if it was all all overlapping. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Good. Okay. Okay. Um Some of your areas in your lawn may need more water than others, and, and this is something to keep in mind. 
Um, especially if you have a sloping lot. Um, we, we have one customer over here right on uh, Sleepy Bay Boulevard and they're right on the river, but they have one of those really long lots that you know, go several hundred feet out. Their house is close to the road, so up by the road it's built up, and then the backyard slopes down, and the bottom of the backyard is very wet. The water table is high, so it's, it's marshy, actually. So the way they have it set up is they have that back, back area of that backyard set up on a different zone so they can water it less than they um, water the front, the front yard and the upper part of the backyard. They don't water it all the same. They have it set for different, for uh, fewer days and a different length of time. Some areas that are in direct sunlight versus shade will need more water. Um, even you know, most irrigation systems are set up with, uh, with shrubs on one zone and grass on another. Grass will always need more irrigation than shrubs will, especially if the shrubs are mature. If the shrubs are mature, they really don't need any irrigation, supplemental irrigation at all, unless you want to give it to them and you're really getting, you know, want them, want them to grow. Um, and, and, but if, you, if they grow a lot, you're going to have to trim them a lot. But if they're mature, they really don't even need supplemental irrigation. Um, let's talk about a, a few uh, irrigation, irrigation do's and don'ts. Um, when is the best time to water? How often? The best time of day? Things like that. So uh, the best time of day to water, to put water on the lawn is the same time of day that the dew is normally on the ground. Um, normally I say anywhere from midnight to say 8 a.m. That's the best time to run your irrigation system. The reason for that is that if you water outside of that window, you're extending the number of hours during the day that the grass is wet. And what that does is that sets up a favorable environment for uh, disease to develop in the lawn. So you, you don't want the grass to stay wet any longer than it normally would from, from day to day. Um, how, often, how, you know, how often should you run the system? Um, again, the, the best thing to do is just watch the lawn and, and give it water as, as it needs it. But if you're like me, you're busy, you kind of want to set it and forget it and not worry about it. So what, what I normally recommend in, in weather like this, that we're having sporadic rain, you know, we just had some heavy rain a few days ago, but we haven't had any since then. And if you haven't watered since that heavy rain, your lawn could very well be in drought stress by now because the soil is not holding, holding any of that water anymore that, that we, we got. So I would, I would recommend every other day and if the lawn looks like it's drought stressing a little bit, just go ahead and, and switch it over to every day. Um, in the middle of the summer, every day, there's, there's this uh, phrase that horticulture industry has, it's called evapotranspiration. And what that is, is that's just a fancy term that talks about how fast the grass loses moisture. So, um, the, the, if you think about it, uh, you know, when you, when you cut off a, a blade of grass or you cut off any, any piece of vegetation, uh, it automatically starts to wilt because it's losing, it's losing moisture. Grass is constantly, the, 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 all the vegetation in the grass is constantly losing moisture, um, but it's being replaced by the root system. So, in certain weather conditions, whether it's you know very sunny out, cloudy, um, the temperature plays a big part of it. So when we're hot and sunny, that evapotranspiration is happening very quickly. The grass is losing a lot of water, so that water has to be replaced. The roots have to have that water available in the soil to pick it up and to replace that grass, that uh, moisture that that grass is losing. 
Um, so every other day to every day would be a good frequency uh, this time of year. Now as the as, as the temperatures cool in the, in the fall, slowly back off that irrigation, mainly because cool, moist conditions are, are, are ideal for disease development in the grass. Um, when we're going around treating our lawns, we see disease most frequently in the early spring and late fall when temperatures are cool, like in the 70s, and maybe we, we've either had a lot of rain or people are watering their lawn a lot. Um, if, um, if, if, say, it's 70 degrees and you're still watering every day, uh, very likely you can ignite some disease activity in the lawn. So as, that, as, the, as the season, growing season starts to come to an end, as temperatures start to, start to fall off, then back off the water to three days a week, two days a week, one day a week. Generally speaking, we say after November, turn the water off completely because the grass, by that time, the grass is dormant. It's not growing. Grass will actually shed some of its root system during that time when it goes into dormancy. And it, it, won't, it, it doesn't require any water at all. It's cool and it's just dormant. So if you, again, if, you, if you're watering during that time and keeping the grass moist when it's not actually using the water and there's no, and since it's cool, the water is not evaporating as quickly, what you're doing is you're just keeping the grass wet and, and again, setting up a, an ideal condition for, for develop, uh, disease development in the, uh, in the lawn. Um, another reason not to water as not to water too frequently is certain uh, types of grass, mainly centipede, is very responsive to a lot of water. And what will happen is, is if, if you water centipede very heavily every day and maybe perhaps fertilize it once or twice or three times a year, which you're not supposed to do, but I know, you know, conscientious homeowners, that's what they do. They get that, they get that new lawn. Centipede is the most common grass for, for builders to put in to, to their new construction because it's relatively cheap. It, it, um, if, they, if they have, um, if, if it goes down and it's kind of dry, they can put water to it and it'll pop right back. And it's just, it's just good for the, you know, it's, it's good for the construction industry, but if once the homeowner gets it, you know, they keep watering it every single day and then they go to Lowe's and they get a, a bag of um, this stuff right here, which I don't recommend, um, and they put it, put it on their lawn. It's very high nitrogen. It just, it just poofs the lawn up and, and it, it creates a really lush green lawn, but the problem is, is there's no root system there. The, the grass puts all of its energy into creating top growth with very little root growth. So over, in a short period of time, say a couple years, you have an issue where you have a lawn that's top heavy and it starts to collapse and you have these big dead areas showing up in the lawn where where there's just so much top growth and no root system to support it, the lawn just starts to starts to collapse. So that's that's you know a, a good reason to kind of moderate the water and not you know not not overdo it. Water waters you know you 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 can with watering you can get too much of a good thing going. So and it creates thatch and it just uh, not not a healthy you know can can be unhealthy for the lawn. Okay. Um, any any questions so far? Yes. What's the uh, target amount of water this time of year we want to apply to at least every part of the lawn? Yeah, uh, good question. So another good rule of thumb is um, put down less uh, more water less often than less water more often. So this time of year, you you want you want to put 
a good volume of water down so that it soaks down in maybe an inch or two into the soil. Uh, with most irrigation systems, that's going to be at least 30 minutes, maybe 45, maybe 45 minutes to an hour. It's not, the volume of water that you put down is, is not going to, if you put too much volume down at one time, it's not going to hurt anything, really. It's the frequency that you really have to watch. But if you put downs, if you set your, your system to go off for an hour uh, and, and get a really good soaking and do that maybe every other day uh, and the lawn stays nice and green, then, then that, that would be good. It's, it's hard to have a blanket, you know, you know, this is what you do for every lawn because, again, every lawn is its own microenvironment. It, it has, you know, different amounts of sunshine, different amounts of shade, different amounts of, you know, the soil texture, even though it's all sandy, some of it can be different. Even different types of grass require different types of, you know, different amounts of water. When you said, um, said that the principal one out, you mean each station or the whole thing? Yeah, good question. Every zone. Every zone, one hour. Yes. You talked about midnight to 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. I would think that putting it down at midnight would be a lot different than putting it down at 6 a.m. because, you know, from 6 a.m. it's going to get hot sooner and start to get that right. If you did it at midnight, it's more time to soak in. So right. That's a pretty wide range. I would think that, you know, you might see a difference between midnight versus. Yeah, I'm, you know, midnight, mid, you, you normally it's midnight to 8 a.m. What I, what I mean is if you start at midnight and s start sometime after midnight and make sure the last zone finishes before 8 a.m. If it's done before 8 a.m., that should be enough time for the water to soak into the soil before it, it evaporates. Yes? Do most irrigation systems, if you have them set up by zone, mm -hmm. just to say four zones, Mm -hmm. Do they like or do they want or do they require a time in between the zones where you're not going from zone one to zone two to zone three? Any time, 15 minutes in there, does the pump or motor want that or require it? Okay. Um, that's a good question. And what we'll do is we'll just take that question and transition into talking about the different types of irrigation systems here because some, uh, one, uh, the, the analog type of system does require that, that rest period in between zones, but the digital doesn't. So let me just go ahead and talk about how each of these systems operates and so you can kind of get an understanding of, of how, they, how they work. Before you do that, Chris, yes. let me ask an aside question. Sure. We have two or three companies that we refer that can do that. They specialize in irrigation and be happy to give you their, as a matter of fact, probably I'll, I'll, during the break, I'll write their names and numbers on the board. That way you can, you can get them off the board and, and, uh, and, and have that. So anyway, most irrigation systems have um, a centrifugal pump like this and this, this, the large tube is the tube that uh, is the straw, I call it the straw that goes down into the aquifer. So um, at the bottom or at the, um, not at the bottom, but this little bulb here is a check valve. So what it does is when the, when the water is pulled up out of the well, this is a one-way valve and it stops the water from falling back into the well so that it it stays, the pump stays primed. If we didn't have this check valve here, you would have to prime the pump every time. If you have an issue with your pump losing prime, it could very well be the check valve is going bad, or it could be that one of these, these joints here has an air leak in it that uh, is causing the pump to, to suck air and, and not suck water. So the pump pulls pulls the water from the well into the pump. The, the actual pump itself is only this front part of this machine here. It's, it's, it's a it's, it's relatively small part and inside 
this cavity, the, the impeller that propels the water is only a disc about that big. It's really small. It's amazingly small. And it has little holes in it, but because it has a horse and a half electrical motor here, it spins that disc so fast that it's able to pump up to 30 gallons of water a minute. And that's, that's about the, that's what these uh, horse and a half pumps are designed to do with a, uh, a shallow irrigation well is to pump 30 gallons of water a minute. Now the reason that's important is, is because each head that you have on a zone will put out so many gallons a minute so you're limited, you, you, you're limited on the number of heads that you can have in each zone because if you get over 30 then the pressure goes way down. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So the water comes, comes out of the well into the pump and then it pumps it out of the pump through here and it will, in an analog system, it'll go to an index valve. Now these index valves usually have four or six different pipes coming down. They can, they can be anywhere from two to six zones but, um, but the, the index valve themselves will have a place for up to six pipes. Now just because they have six doesn't mean they're going to use all six pipes because what they have is in the top, in the very top they have a cam and these cams, there's numbers on them and it will determine how many zones will actually be used. So if it has if it has six pipes, but it only has four places on the cam, it's only going to use four zones. So these, the, so these are expandable. If you have four zones and you have six pipes, you, you have two pipes that you can still use if you need to add another zone. So the way, the way these work, these index valves work, is they work on pressure. So when the pump turns on and it pressures up, this little cam changes inside here and it switches to a zone. When the pump turns off, the cam changes again. When it comes back on, it's on a different zone and it just keeps going around and around and around to, to, to the different, different zones in the, uh, in the system. Yes? Should that cam ever leak water? Yeah, it can. Actually, um, it has a little um, rubber O-ring right here, and sometimes those little O-rings get damaged or swollen or whatever, and, and they can leak. It's not a big problem, but you can replace that O-ring there and put it in there so it doesn't leak. Yes? If you uh, check the valve is malfunctioning, you're going to lose prime because of the size of the pipe. Mm -hmm. Are you, if you have air above that check valve leaking in, mm -hmm. I mean, how dramatic is that to affect the cam? That's a good question because what, what, what I've seen happen is you can have a small air leak and it's maybe an intermittent air leak and the pump will surge. It'll <laughs> Yeah, it'll pull up water and then, and then it'll, you know, that air leak will, you know, kind of the water will just kind of surge a little bit. And when it surges, even though the pump is on running, these zones will change because they're gaining and losing pressure. Um, okay, so if you put soapy water around all of the seals, Mm -hmm. and not find any bubbles or anything like that. I mean, that's one way to check to see if you have an air leak. Now, with a check valve, can it be partially malfunctioning? Or fully mal you, know, you know, is that all or none thing with the check valve? Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you wouldn't see any evidence of an air leak if you use soapy water because it's sucking in. It's okay. not blowing out. Okay. So what I would do if more than likely, um, 
it's, it's an air leak. And what I would do is if, if I were having that problem and I've had customers that have had that problem is just, just, just replumb everything from the check valve back up and make sure it's sealed tight. And it's, it's, you know, the, the threaded area where it goes, screws into the front of the pump. That's actually the most critical part. That's the easiest part to get an air leak, but make sure every, every glue joint is glued down really good and just replumb the whole thing. That's, that would be the easiest rather than try and troubleshoot it. Replace a check valve and say, damn, that wasn't it. Yeah, just do the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Anytime you replace one of these parts between the well and the pump, replace them all because you never, you never know. Thank you. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe comes over and says, hey, you still working on that phone? <laughs> 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 but, um, I find that one of the things when I put an air leak down there, and it was, we just get a hose and put it on there, and it suddenly starts to work. Yep. Oh, the check valve was bad. I changed the check valve, yep. which is not an easy job. Right. But after that, the indexer would cycle once and okay that's that one works the next one it can still stay on one what causes that indexer to not rotate that can okay yes and let, let me just uh, reiterate something that you just said which is a good good point is that if you think you have an air leak here one thing like if the pump won't prime if you're you if you're okay to, to prime a pump if it, you open the spigot on the top take a garden hose running and just hold it on the top so water goes down here and gets in the in the pump cavity while it's running um, that's what you would do like if you drained it in in the in the winter uh, so it wouldn't freeze and just let it run if it wasn't if it wasn't priming then you would take the hose and just kind of wet the top of it top of these pipes because if there was an air leak there then it would seal temporarily seal up that air leak and if you heard the sound of the pump change or all of a sudden it started pumping water then that would also you know indicate you had an air leak there because it's harder to pull water through that small crack than it would be air and that's, that's exactly what makes the, yep so my question instead of ripping <clears throat> out all the guts between the check valve and the pump what if you got a can of that like you know buddy spray stuff that foams up oh, and sealant. yeah the sealant stuff would that work as you could pepper? try it is probably not going to work because it just <clears throat> put it this way i've never known an irrigation person to to do that if, if it worked consistently you, irrigation people would do that i've yeah. never known one to do that yeah. but anyway getting back to your question about the um check valve um why is it not turning what um sometime yeah the, yeah, the indexer. Um, sometimes what will happen is you'll get a piece of debris in there or uh, maybe some um, uh, mold or, or, or something in there that's, that's causing it to stick. There's several bolts on top of here. They're very simple, the, the internal, internals. It's just a rubber pad and a spring basically is all it is. So just un unscrew these screws on the top, pull it out, wash it out really good, um, clean it, maybe put a little bit of lubricant on it, put it back, see if it works. If it doesn't work, then it's, you know, they're plastic, so that it could be this plastic is scarred or something, just replace it. They're not, you know, a a after you've cleaned it, if it works great, if it doesn't, just, just replace it. Well, the cam itself that rotates gets a build of grunge in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, it's good. Intermittent, that's the problem. Why is it? Because sometimes it'll index and the two zones will come up. Not full, just part. Right, right. It'll get stuck in the middle. Right, yeah. And, and it could be, you know, the, the, the cam itself has these little things in it that, anyway, if, 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 this is, if this is new, you can get a new cam. They sell these by themselves. So you could get a new one to see if maybe it, you know, a, a fin got broken off in there or something. Okay. Uh, you should. Well, you're right. Some of it is it green? 
Is it metal and green? Yes. There's about okay. 10 tapes. Yeah. Yeah, some of them, the metal ones, you can't. You're right. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Sure. I'll check that. Thank you. Uh huh. Yes. Uh, just getting back to something you said when you prime your pump, you put the hose on the top mm -hmm. while it's running. Wouldn't water shoot out from that? It will, it will once it gets primed, but then you just shut it off really quick. Oh, so it's okay to run. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. You, you just, you. You can hear the pump. You can, you know, it'll it'll make a certain noise while it's running, and then once it starts catching and pulling water, it'll start kind of and when you hear that sound, then you you know just shut that down and your sprinklers come up. You just kind of get to know that. So anyway, um, the timer that runs this system actually, it's it's easier to think about this timer as just a really fancy on-off switch because that's all it is. It's just, a, it's just a really fancy switch. And the way, the way it works is, is it turns the pump off and on and lets it run for a certain amount of time. And then it turns it off and lets it set for 15 minutes while that cam changes. And then it turns it back on again. These pins on the big dial, which is the, the day dial, um, depending on where these pins are and you can you can pull them out and change them and put them back depending on where those pins are will determine what time of day the pump comes on and each pin represents 15 minutes of run time so if you have three pins in there in a row the pump's going to run for 15 minutes or, I'm sorry 45 minutes if you have if you have three pins in a row it's going to run 45 minutes and then if you have a space, it's going to rest for 15 minutes. And then three more pins, it'll run 45 minutes. So if you had four zones, you would have four sets of pins, with each with a space in between it. So the pump would turn on for 45 minutes, turn off for 15, on for 45, off for 15, on for 45, and off for off until the next cycle came around. Um, the small dial down here is the week dial, a uh, day of the week dial, and it determines what days of the week the system comes off and on. So this determines what time of day and how long it runs. This determines which day it runs. So on this particular timer, these plastic timers, if the, small, if the pins on the small dial are pushed in, it will run that day. If they are pulled out, then it will skip that day. There are some other timers like this that are metal and they have a yellow face on them. They're the opposite. If, if on the small dial, if the pin is pulled out, it will run. If it's pushed in, it'll skip that day. So I have to make that clarification because some there's a few dials out there. This is the most common, but there are some out there that, are, that have a metal face to them and they're yellow. And they're the, the, day, the day dial is opposite. I've had people that have you know, thought they had, had it set for every day and they had everything turned off. So, yes? You can buy those pins, I'm asking you now. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, Ace Hardware or any of those. I, I don't think Ace has them, but um, Irrigation and landscape uh, stores like Ewing Irrigation. There's one in Fort Walton on, on Lovejoy Road and in, in Pensacola. Also, I'll put that on the, on the board as well. But yes, you can buy those pins. Well, there's two different sets of pins you have. You can buy both of them. Right? Well, the, the pins on the, on the small wheel don't come out. Oh, okay. They, they just, they just stay in there, but they just, they don't come all the way out. You okay. can just pull, pull them out and then push them back in. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, this will just turn, turn the system off and on. If you want to turn it on manual, there's, there's three, on, on the on-off switch, there's three positions. There's one that says auto, which if you've got it on auto, if the pin, is, if the sp pin on the small wheel is pushed in and the pin, when the pin comes around on the big wheel, it'll hit a little switch here and it'll turn the pump on and then it'll go through its cycle and then, and then shut off. If you want to turn it on manually, 
you just turn the position to on, let it run. Say, say you're trying to get, check a certain zone, you would turn it on, let it run, say that's not the zone you want, and you turn it back off, wait about 30 seconds. You don't have to wait 15 minutes like this is set up. 30 seconds is usually enough. And then turn it back on, and that should be enough time for this to reset, and boom, pull up the next zone. And if that's not the zone you want, you turn it off again, wait 10 or 15 seconds, and just keep doing that. And every time you turn it off and on, this will rotate around until it comes up to the zone that you're wanting. Yes? Now, the way you have your white pen set on the, on the timer, mm -hmm. uh, do those correspond to certain zones or not necessarily? That's a good question. Um, the, the, the answer is no. Um, because all, this, all these pins do is turn the pump off and on. It doesn't have anything to do with which of these come up first. Now what you can do if you want, say, say you've got one zone that's your flower bed, you only want it to run 15 minutes, but you have another zone that's your grass, you want it to run 45 minutes. And you want the flower bed zone to be the very first zone with, with only one pin in it. So what you would do, you would figure out what the last zone was. You would turn it off, turn it on, turn it off, turn it on until you got to the last zone and it was ready for that flower bed zone and just leave it. And then when it came on automatically, that would be the first zone to come up. That's one of the drawbacks of this system. They're, they're very rugged and they're very kind of simple and they get the job done and they're easy to work on and all that kind of stuff, but you have very limited capability with them as far as watering different parts of the yard at different times, different days for different, I mean, you're very limited. If you, um, with this system, you, you have a lot more flexibility. With this one, it's like, it's either, it's either usually either run the whole system or don't run it at all. You know, you can't choose okay, I want zone one to run today, but I don't want zone two to run today. You can't do that with this system. Um, you can only do it with a system like that. So what we'll do, we'll go ahead and take a break now, and when we come back, we'll talk about the um, digital system. Thank you for joining me for this presentation. If you're having problems with your lawn, call me for a free consultation, 850-939-939. I just have this passion for taking unhealthy lawns, finding out what it's going to take to make them healthy again. Father and Son has been taking care of my lawn since I installed it. I have people stop all the time and tell me I have the best lawn in Kelly Plantation. It's just incredible. So I would recommend Father and Son. As a matter of fact, people have stole my signs off the grass after you come and spray. So I think they want them for the number. I'm very happy with what Father and Son does. Call me today for a free consultation to find out how I can help you with your troubled lawn. What we're going to do now is we're going to talk about the, uh, the digital systems. The digital systems are, um, there are certain advantages to these digital systems. Number one is the main advantage is, is that you can program each individual zone to run however long you want, whenever you want. Whereas with the analog system, either the, all the zones run or all the zones don't run, <clears throat> with this system, you can program it to where, like, uh, like we mentioned before, if you have a house with a very sunny backyard or, and a very shady backyard, you can water the front yard every day or you can, and you can water the backyard two or three times a week, as long as they're on different zones. Um, so it's a lot more flexible, it's, it's, it, it gives a lot more, um, like I say, flexibility about, about how, you can, how you can water the, the different parts of your landscape. Um, the, way, the way these work is <clears throat> there is, this is a, uh, This is an electric switch or a solenoid, solenoid switch 
that goes to the pump. So when the, you have the timer set to come on, it sends a signal to this switch. The switch turns on, which turns the pump on at the same time. This timer also sends a signal to the valve that controls the zone that you want to come on and it, it electronically opens this valve to allow the water to go through that, that zone and, and water that part of the landscape. So it's, uh, it's a little more complicated, obviously a little more you know, electronics involved. The kind of the Achilles heel of this system is power surges. Um, whereas whereas this, this system is pretty bulletproof, you know, you don't really normally have any problems with it. They just wear out over time. Um, with this system, we have so many lightning storms in this area. Uh, a lightning surge can knock these out and they, the, the brains can get scrambled and, you know, whatever. Um, they, can, they can get crosswired to where you have to, you know, that these, um, you don't have to replace the whole system if that happens, but you just have to replace the, the board. There's like a, a wire strip in here that comes out and, and this, um, this whole door comes out. So you, if, if that happens, you just replace this and just leave everything else in place and just, just plug another one in. I'd, I'm gonna guess these are about $100 or something like that. So it's not terribly expensive. Uh, if, if that happens, but, but they, are, they, they are susceptible to, uh, to power surges and, and lightning storms. Were those vendors those? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, Ewing Irrigation uh, would sell them if you want it, if, you, if you're looking to do it yourself or either of the other, um, either of the other guys would be able to help you with that. Let's see if I can get that back in. I'm sorry? These, they're not really expensive. Uh, I want to say they're about 20 or $30 a piece, something like that. But these rarely go bad. I've, this, I have this system in my, in my yard, and I replaced the timer, but I haven't, re I, maybe I replaced one of these. I have six zones. And it's been in operation since about 1990. So it's been running a long time. I mean, the, the guy, I know the guy who put it in did a, a really good job. He just made sure everything was sealed really well. And because um, it's, you know, everything is underground and moisture is always a problem. But, but my, my system's been running pretty much without a, a problem since 1990, other than I, replacing the, upgrading the, the timer. So if you wanted to change from an analog to a digital system, it's pretty much not an FYI kind of thing, I mean, include do yourself kind of thing. Well, it depends on how mechanically inclined you are. I mean, it can be done and we've done it, uh, I've seen it done several times. It's just, what you do is you replace this index valve with these electronic valves and you replace this timer with these two components mm-hmm mm -hmm. and it you know it, it can be done so if you need if you need more flexibility in your watering it's you know it it's it's done it is something that can be done yes so if you have a six zone and you've got split your main water coming in six times put on six valves Mm -hmm. it would, there would be, yeah, if you have six zones, you would have six valves just like this. How does, how does that all split up? Well, usually the way they do it is, is they build a manifold and they have it in one place and they have, they have the, the, the water coming out of the pump down into the manifold and there's six valves and whichever valve whichever zone is running then that valve is open and the rest of them are closed that's now, all above ground? huh those are all above ground no underground you well they're supposed to be underground i've seen them installed every way you can imagine but they're supposed to be underground and they're supposed to have valve covers you know like um 
valve boxes around them so that you can access them if you need to. Um, but, you know, I've seen some people install them above ground. It's just it's a lot neater and cleaner to put them underground. And they're built to install underground. And not susceptible to freeze if they're in the ground either, right? That's true. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, just barely below ground is fine for around here for the cold weather we have. If you had them above ground, yes, we have cold enough weather to where these could freeze and, and crack. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, yes, um, they do, but you have to, this, this analog system actually has a switch for a rain sensor. You have to have the type of analog system that you can hook up a rain sensor to it. So if it has this switch that has rain sensor switch on it, then yes, you can. I've got the yellow face. Okay, the yellow face, they don't have, they don't have that. You could get another timer. These timers are about $120. And you could get one with a rain sensor on it and just swap it out with the one that you have and, and hook a rain sensor to it. A rain sensor is just a, a little device that goes, usually they hang it on the gutter of the, of the house and it is able to detect when there's a rain and if this, and it shuts off the timer for a short period of time, you know, for a day or so if, if it detects that it's, it's rain. Yeah, it'll skip. Yeah, if it rains, if it rains and the rain sensor detects it, then it'll just skip that day. So now that I hold you to for budgetary purposes, uh -huh. what, uh, what do you think a ballpark would be for converting analog to digital? Um, when, I, I'll tell you what, when we were doing irrigation work, we were charging $150 per zone for the conversion. So like a six zone system would be like $900. So, and, and by the way, speaking of rain sensors, you may not be aware, but Florida, it's actually Florida law that you have a rain sensor on your timer. Now, I will tell you this, I've never seen anybody arrested <laughs> for not having a timer on their, or not having a rain sensor on their timer, but it is Florida law, so just that's FYI. Is it as simple to add a rain sensor to a digital system as it is to the analog? Yes, and all, all as far as I'm, as far as I know, all digital systems will ha be compatible with a rain sensor. There's like two little there's there's um, posts up here where you know you just thread the wire in and add it right there. And so. automatically it'll sense it. It'll automatically sense that it's rained and just shut, shut the system off. And they're pretty reliable. They're, they're fairly reliable. They, they don't leave the system off longer than it needs to be, and they usually do shut it off when it rains. So it's a pretty good, pretty good thing to have. But what if it doesn't shut off? I mean, my rain sensor doesn't appear to work. Yeah, it could be the wiring. It could be a lot of, th you know, I mean, there could be other, you know. A lot of them are wireless now, and they, you know, it could be the battery. If it's wireless, it could be it's not, you know, it needs a new battery, something like that. So, okay. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, ir uh, adjusting irrigation heads and doing irrigation repairs. There's two different types of irrigation heads, basically. Um, one is a rotor, and the, these are the type of heads that shoot out a, a stream of water and they rotate back and forth. That's, that's the way the rotor is. Now, the way these, this is a rainbird head. Most heads adjust the same way. The, they may have different apparatus to adjust it with. It may require a little different tool, or you may be able to do it without a tool, but they're all basically the same. And the way, the way they work is um, there's an arrow on the top which shows you where the water comes out. And the, the head itself moves back and forth. And these come from the factory preset to, uh, to cover 180 degrees, a half circle. 
Okay? And then down at the bottom, and I'll let you guys come up and, you know, you can come up and look at these, but there's a, uh, a little place where you can insert a screwdriver and it has a plus and a minus sign on here. It's important to know that the left side of the arc is fixed. You can't change it. So when you put it in the ground, if I'm, if I'm going to put it right here and I want it to cover, you know, this direction on the left side, I need to turn the whole head so that the arrow is pointing that way. And then I adjust however far I want the right side of the arc to go. So if I want it to go, say, to 90 degrees, or that's about 90 degrees right there. If I want to increase it, I, I put my little screwdriver in here. This is a Rainbird screwdriver. It works the best. You don't have to have a Rainbird screwdriver, but as long as it's a small one like this, it works. And you just find the slot, and then I'll turn it to the positive direction. And now it's about, about 180 degrees. If I wanted to do a 360, I just do the same thing. I put it in there, find the slot, which is sometimes hard to do. Come on here. There it is. OK, and then I would just turn it all the way to the positive until it, until it just stopped. And now the head will go all the way around. And it'll stop, and then it'll turn all the way back. It won't keep going in a circle. It'll just go all the way around one way, and then all the way around the other way in a 360. It's, up to 180. It, well, it, you, you can increase it up to 360. Oh. It's preset from the factory. It's preset at 180. If you want to lessen it, say, to a 90, you would just turn it toward the negative to just bring it in on the right-hand side. Or if you wanted to want it to do like a 270, you would just increase it so it did a three-quarter circle. Mm-hmm. The, the, yeah, the, 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 that's where the water comes out, and this is the plus or minus where you're adjusting it. So right now it's, it's at about 360. Well, not quite 360, but okay. almost. Okay, so if I want to decrease that, I'll turn it toward the negative. And now it only does 180. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So your pointer, that's adjusted by rotating the head with the whole mechanism? The left side of the arc. So if you're standing in front of the head, your left side is going to be fixed. Right. So if you turn, if you turn the top of the head. If you're looking at it and you turn it all the way to the left counterclockwise to where it stops, that's, that's where wherever you want that to stop, that's fixed. You can't change that. So if I'm, if I'm going to put it in the ground right here and that's the left side of the arc, then I have to set it in there so the whole sprinkler head is facing that direction. Okay? So yes. you can turn that little dial by hand right now, as long as it's not on, it doesn't damage anything. Correct. It doesn't hurt anything. Yeah. Okay. So um, then um, most sprinkler systems are set up like this. They have from the main, the main pipe that goes through the yard, they have a piece of what they call funny pipe or flex pipe connected to it and then they have a little nipple and it and it connects to the flex pipe like that 
And the reason for this flex pipe is it's a lot it easier to set the sprinkler head right at the correct level in the ground. Um, and if you happen to run over it with a mower or something, it kind of flexes a little bit and doesn't break the pipe. In the old days, they used to hard pipe, what they call hard pipe it. And the, the sprinkler head was directly you know, into the hard pipe and you had to get that pipe perfectly level in the ground. And you know, in order to get the sprinkler head level, you had the trench head to be level. And then if, if it was sticking out a little bit and you happen to step on it or run over it, it could crack the pipe. It just, anyway, the, the funny pipe works a whole lot better. Um, so if, if you're needing to change out a head, when you dig it out, this is what you're going to see. You're going to, you know, you're going to see this little nipple right here. It's called a, a barb 90 is what they call it. And the sprinkler head will screw into there. Now, what will happen sometimes is these little, these little barbs will break off. They'll, they'll break and you'll have the, have part of it stuck inside here. They actually have a tool, an extraction tool you can get. You can get them at Ace Hardware. And, and basically it's a little simple little tool. You just stick it in there and it, and it, and it has uh, blades inside there and it extracts that piece of broken plastic that, that can get stuck inside that, in, inside that head. Hmm? The tool is cheaper than the sprinkler head. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so sometimes these, these heads will get clogged, and maybe all the heads on your zones will be running fine, but you'll have one that just, you know, just not doing too well. There's a filter at the bottom of these heads that, that you can just pull out and clean like that. So what what will happen a lot of times is you'll have junk and you know whatever debris get inside these filters and they just they just come right out and you just pull it out, wash it out, rinse, rinse that out, put it back and and put the put the head back together. Um, yes. Would, would that be the case where I've got a couple of them that are left standing? Um, the filter wouldn't necessarily be that, but it, it could be that um, you've got some debris um, in, inside here. You could just take these apart, clean them out, um, make sure that they're, you know, um, the seals around here are good. By the time you go to all that trouble, it might be easier just to get a new head. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is it the rotors or is it the pop-ups that are staying up? Is it the this? The pop-up, yeah, the pop-ups are worse about that than the rotors are. You usually don't have that kind of problem with the rotors. Okay, the other important thing to know about these um, rotors is there's a little nozzle right here. And this nozzle determines how many gallons per minute this sprinkler head will distribute. Um, and you can change the gallons per minute that this, this sprinkler head is putting out. You can increase it or decrease it based on the size of nozzle. They actually make different size nozzles to go in here anywhere from like about, this, this nozzle is a three gallon per minute nozzle. Um, this goes down to, I think, one, one gallon per minute and it can go up to five gallons per minute. Um, so let's say, let's say, remember when we talked about the, the sprinkler head that was doing the 360 and the area that it was covering was getting 25% of the water of the one that was doing the 90? Well, the easiest solution to that would be to go from maybe a three gallon to a six gallon nozzle um, to see if that would, in that 360, if it, would, if it would put out enough volume of water while it was running to cover that area. And the way you do that is there's another little, there's a slot right here, there's a, there's a set screw that comes down here that holds that nozzle in place. And a lot of times, sometimes if that set screw gets backed up, 
gets, you know, backs out, then that nozzle will just blow out and you'll have a, just a huge stream of water coming out of the, coming out of the sprinkler head. But um, in order to replace the nozzle, you just back off that set screw. And then what I do is I just put my screwdriver in there and just pull the nozzle out like that. And it just, it just comes right out. And then choose whatever size nozzle you want to go in there. And push it right back in there. And then make sure you replace the set screw. Put the, you know, screw the, screw the uh, set screw back down. Because if you don't, you turn, when you turn the system on, that nozzle will come flying out of that front of the, front of the, uh, Sprinkler head, is like that. Is that label with anything on it? Is it labeled? Does it say anything on there or is it just a little? <coughs> no, it just, uh, it just has that little right there is where you. Uh, I wonder what that was. Yeah, it's right oh, there. Okay. That's where you. Uh-huh. OK, any questions about rotors? Yes. Uh, one quick one. Um, say you got an arc that's 20 or 30 feet long, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and just from appearance, it looks like just the end is what's getting water. But is it actually water in the hole? Yeah. The way, and that's a good question, the way these nozzles are designed, they're designed to create what's called a rain curtain. And it's designed at the proper pressure and volume to create the same amount of water from the nozzle all the way to the end, just like a curtain. Now. What can happen is the nozzles themselves can become damaged, scarred, whatever. If they become messed up, then that rain curtain will not be an even distribution from the sprinkler head all the way out to the end of the end of the stream. So if you, you know, you if you suspect that that's the problem, then you could replace the nozzle with a brand new one and it should create a, a good even rain curtain. Like that. The little one you just took out or the whole insert? No, the little one I just took out. Yeah, if that little, if that little nozzle is, is messed up, it's plastic, it's soft plastic. So, you know, maybe if you have a little bit of sand in your well or, you know, debris or, or oh, just a use over time, if they get worn down, then that, you know, that the way that nozzle is designed is not going to work efficiently and it's not going to create that rain curtain the way it's supposed to. Okay. Uh, I think so. You can. I'm not, I know you can get them at Ace Hardware. Uh, Ewing Irrigation also carries them. I know if you go to Ewing, you can get. They call it a nozzle tree, and you can. You know, they'll just give you a nozzle tree, and you know, with whatever nozzle. Ace Hardware. I think they have them individually. The different nozzles individually. But yeah, you can. You can get them at at least those two places. Okay, so. This is a pop-up sprinkler. What these do is they pop up and just spray a steady stream of, of water. It's important to know that these heads put out more volume of water in the area they're covering than these do. These, care, these cover a much larger area. These cover a smaller area. So therefore, they're putting out more water. So if you have, it's, Whenever you do an irrigation, whenever they put in an irrigation system, it's always recommended not to mix the diff mix different types of heads on the same zone. So if you have some of these heads and some of these heads on the same zone, the areas that these heads are watering are going to get a whole lot more water than the areas that these heads are watering, just because they cover a small area and they're putting out more volume in the area. Um, these also have filters in them. And because the nozzles themselves are smaller, the filters usually um, get clogged up more. They have a, they have a finer filter. So um, on the top of these, th this is actually the spray nozzle. And the filter is inside the stem like that. And a lot of times, you'll, like 
usually if you have these heads at the end of a zone, that's, they're the ones that are going to catch all the debris coming through the pipes and you know, all that kind of iron or whatever. And the, I know with my, you know, my uh, zone at my house that has these heads on it in my driveway at the end of the driveway, the heads, the pop-ups at the end of the driveway, every year always get cram-packed with junk that's, that's in there. So um, this is the way the, the filters come out. This actually, these, this, this is an adjustable nozzle. Some of these nozzles are fixed and some of them are adjustable. It just, and, and again, you can buy the different nozzles at uh, Ace Hardware or any other irrigation place. And just like the rotors, the left side is fixed and then you just increase the right side of the arc by turning this little collar here and you have yeah you, ha you can kind of look at it and see about where it's set and then you can turn it on or you can adjust it while it's on um, but you can turn it anywhere from doing a 360 all the way to just a a small you know narrow narrow stream of uh of water um one ad one advantage of having, uh, let me show you this here. What will happen sometimes is if you're working on an irrigation head and it, it pops in like that, it's really hard to get that stem out of there. However, the little wings on this irrigation screwdriver you can reach in here and there's a ledge on that on the edge of that stem and you can hook it with one of the wings and you can pull it out like that so that's uh, one advantage of having this little uh, rainbird screwdriver is it's designed to pull those stems out if you if you need to uh, Where do you get those screwdrivers? Um, a, a Ewing irrigation again uh, would have them for sure uh, I heard I was in Ace Hardware the other day, and I heard somebody asking for them, and they said they didn't have them. So, eight and a half dollars for that? I think you could. I think they would give them to you for free if you went in there. I think you might be able to find them online too. I don't know. I haven't looked. Uh, that's a good question. Um, the question is the the quality of the heads. Are they all the same? No, they're not. Um, Rainbird is a good, I like, personally, I like Rainbird just probably because I've worked with it all, you know, my whole career. And um, they, they put out a pretty good product. Lowe's carries the Orbit brand. Orbit, Orbit is just like, um, it's just a, a, they're trying to hit a price point with Orbit. They're not real high quality stuff and it's just, not, I would, you know, and then on the other, you know, the, then there's kind of the other extreme. I, I had to replace an irrigation head in my, uh, in my house the other day, and rather than drive all the way into Fort Walton to go to Ewing, I just went down to Ace Hardware, and, and they, they had these style, um, but then they also had the, this style in stainless steel. And I'm like, why do I need stainless steel? You know, I think it's just they're again trying to, you know, hey, the best of the best. If you want the best of the best, you can get the plastic is fine with me. Um, but uh, this this is called a, a Rainbird 5000. That's the that's the model number 5000. So if um, you know, I, I I think this is a good quality sprinkler sprinkler head. Last last you several years if you maintain it, but. Anything less than that is, you know, it's going to. But they haven't all been replaced. Mm -hmm. It would be best. It would be best to have them all consistent. Okay. It's not going to kill you not to, but, you know, <clears throat> if if they were all because every every he different head it has a little bit of different performance and it's just going to be best to have it all consistent. Okay. Yeah. No, yes. Another question: If you're going to work on your sprinkler head, isn't it important to put it back in the same position? Is it um, usually, but you can look at it and see, and just you know turn the head and make sure that it's 
it's going to be in the same position. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but so it so it has used. Yeah, it has a big circle on top, and okay, it's probably what the old style impact sprinklers. It's you know kinds that you see that they go. You know they have the they have the arm that as they go around that you know it hits the water and. Sh -sh -sh -sh. You could replace that with these, and it would probably be a better. Um, just you know, un unscrew it. It screws in. It screws in the same way to to here. Just yeah, dig around it. The the when you replace a sprinkler head, the key is to dig out far enough around this thing so that dirt doesn't fall in here when you pull the sprinkler head out. That's because that because if it does, then when you put the new sprinkler head back in, it's going to clog it plug it up. So you could just dig it out, unscrew it, and get one of these and screw it back in. That's what you could do. Now if you need to, is it cheaper just to replace the guts or is there up to take them I don't even know if you can buy just the guts. It's maybe easier to replace the guts. You know, you could just pull you pull the head off rather than the whole body if that's, you know, um, but, you know, yeah. That's, that's a good question. Let me just, let me just address that really quick. Um, to answer your question, yes, there's a couple different ways that you can cap a sprinkler head. So if you removed a sprinkler head, basically you would have this. You would have the, the pipe and then you would have the, the um, elbow here. So they do make caps that you can just screw on here. The other thing that you can do, you can take the funny pipe and just crimp it like that put a zip tie around it and, and it'll, it'll do the same thing. So you could do it either way. Yes. Like the uh, dentist will put a cloth around the tooth he's working on. If you take a cloth and cut a hole up, you can put it over the ground on that thing and then that'll keep the dirt. Yeah, down. yeah, yeah, you could do that too. Yeah, that, that would be good. Okay. Okay, um, let me finish up by talking about um, Repairing, uh, and repairing irrigation pipe. There's a few different ways of repairing a broken irrigation pipe. Let me just talk about some of them here. Um, these are a couple examples of quick fixes. Uh, this I got at Ace Hardware. It's a flexible piece of pipe and let's... Um, <clears throat> Say you had a pipe and it, it had a break in it, you can put it in one side of the pipe and the, the thing that's nice about it being flexible is you can, you can bend it so that you can get it to go into the other side of the pipe. That's, that's the hardest thing about fixing an irrigation repair is, is getting, getting the, the splice to go in between the two existing pieces because otherwise if you have two pieces like this, what you have to do is you have to dig them all the way back far enough so that you can lift them up and then put them back together. So. Now, I, if I remember right, this is about $15. So if it's worth saving that much digging, it would be up to you um, to use that. Uh, the, other, uh, the other thing that um, is another little handy tool is, um, is this extension. So if you have a broken pipe, then you can just push it into the push it in like that and it it fixes it without slick sure. yeah without having any 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 issues what do you call that? <laughs> a quick fix you can get them at ace hardware you can get both of these at ace hardware um, and it's just a, a uh, let's see what is it it says on here it says a pro span but I would call it a quick fix pipe, pipe, broken pipe, and whatever. Gets glued as well. Huh? That gets glued as well. Yes, and I'll, I'll, we'll talk about that in a second. 
Okay, so let's talk about glue. There's a couple different, you can get different types of glue. There's not a big difference in irrigation glue. Um, the main thing you need to know about irrigation glue is blue glue dries really quick. Now that can be good if you're trying to work, if you're wet, if you're working in a wet environment. If there's water running through the pipe and you can't stop it or it's raining out or something and you just, you, you, the, the environment you're working in is wet, then the blue glue is a, a good glue to use because it, it'll dry very quickly. Um, this happens to be an all-purpose glue. I mean, there's, there's different types of all-purpose glue. Um, let me just demonstrate the best. If you're going to glue something, um, say if I, if I just want to glue a coupler onto this pipe, what I want to do I want to put glue on the inside on the female end of what I'm gluing and around the male end Don't prime it. Um, I'll talk about that in a second and then as I push it in I want to give it a quarter turn when I give it the quarter turn it that spreads the glue around the whole joint and what the glue does is it actually it actually chemically melts the PVC together and you can it's, see it's already you know it's already really tight um, primer uh, they do make a they call it a purple primer that kind of softens the PVC before you put the glue on I do, personally, I don't use primer because it's irrigation. If it leaks a little bit in the ground, it's, it's, to me, it's not a big deal. Um, if I were using it for a water main or something that was you know, gonna be used for um, drinking water, yes, I would probably do that. Or in a house or an area where a leak would be intolerable. I've, I've never had a problem with irrigation pipes leaking and, and you know starting a leak and then it getting worse and worse I've never had I never had that issue um, with not priming it I have had a problem with only gluing one of the two pieces I had years ago we were doing an irrigation job and I had a young man working with me and I showed him how to do everything and I said here you know glue all these pipes together and he did forgot to tell him to put glue on both pieces <laughs> and we were having you know the, the joints were coming apart because we didn't we had to go back and fix a bunch of joints because he only put glue on one side yes so do you recommend priming on the check valve side of the pump um i well i don't i never have and i've i don't have any leaks so um it, it I, the, the blue glue, though, just because it's it's kind of hot and everything, I usually use the blue glue on the on the pumps. But uh, I mean, it wouldn't be a bad idea. I just I've just never done it. Okay, one of the things that happens a lot of times to irrigation pipes is especially when you have these index valves and you have people using weed eaters around these index valves you get cuts, the weed eaters will actually cut these pipes and you'll have, you know, you'll turn on the sprinkler system and it'll be spraying out the bottom like close to the ground because there will be a little slit in the pipe where the, where the weed eater has, has gotten it or any other type of small crack or small hole or something. There's an easy way to fix those. Um, so if I have, if I have an area you know, say if I just had a, a small little little crack or a small little slit in, in a pipe like this. Oh, and by the way, these are this is a real handy tool. This is a PVC cutter. It's just a blade, and the way you use it is you just hold it firmly like that and turn the pipe, and it cuts it really easy like that. So if, if I had, say, this was the, 
um, the extension of a of an index valve and somebody had run a weed eater around it and there was a slit in there, what I could do is I could take a, a piece of, of pipe like this and then cut it, cut it long ways. And what I would do is I would put glue on the inside, glue around the outside of the pipe, and then I could take the pipe and snap it around there, around the hole. Now this doesn't work for a big, you know, a big hole or, or a cut that's all the way through because there is a gap in the back here, but it's a good band-aid to use if you have a small hole or a small slit or something like that to use in a pipe. Um, one other way that you can, you can fix a, 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 a crack in a pipe, a lot of times, you know, especially in yards like mine where my irrigation system has been in for over 20 years, you know, tree roots and whatever get, get in the yard and, you know, tree roots can actually wrap themselves around irrigation pipes and, you know, the, it, they can cause problems and you need to get in there and, and, and fix a leak or, or replace a pipe or something. Um, if, if I... If, I, if it's just really, it's, if, it, if it's gonna be really difficult to dig out the middle uh, of an area that has a lot of tree roots and something, I can, I can just go around it. I can, I can use uh, like elbows and if I have a pipe that's broken, I can just use elbows and go around it. That's, that would be another easy way to fix it Rather, rather than having to pull the pipe up and stretch it and, and put the coupler in. You'll suffer a loss of pressure though. When you, go. you may lose a little bit of pressure. Again, you know, it, it depends on where it is on the zone and um, how many heads are on the other side of the, um, of the fix, but that's, that is an option. Now how, can, how can you tell if you have a broken pipe on the ground? Maybe it'll puddle? Well, yeah, eventually, usually you'll, if you have a broken pipe, you'll have a loss of pressure uh, in, the, in the system or in the head, or you'll have a hollow, you, it'll create a hole. It'll create a, a hole in the ground. Um, so, you know, a lot of, usually in my, around my yard, I, I had a, I had a, a, a head that, that the, uh, that the uh, nipple had broken off of, and it was just, whenever the system was running, this, the particular head had very low pressure and I looked down, there's a big puddle of water right there. Um, so that's, it's, it's usually pretty obvious. Okay, um, anything that I haven't covered this afternoon that you specifically wanna ask about? Yes. Um, rust in the water, iron in the water. Okay. There's basically three different ways to um, deal with rust in your well water. Number one is to get a rust inhibitor system. And what that is, is it's a tank that sits outside your pump and it siphons chemicals from the tank into the well water that neutralizes the rust. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. It's just kind of, it depends on how much rust and and you have to maintain it. You have to constantly be putting chemicals in it and stuff, you know, and, and it also creates more connection points between the, you know, around the pump, which can lead to air leaks, which can lead to malfunctions. Um, another way is to put in a deep well, like we talked about at the very beginning, that's, if you go down 100 feet, you aren't gonna have any rust, but that's an expensive fix. Um, another solution, is to uh, either use city water around your house or use drip lines so it's not sp like it's not spraying around the house and have it you know and adjust everything so that it so that it's not anywhere near the the house or fence or whatever you know so it's basically use the rust inhibitor adjust the sprinklers so that they don't hit those things or get a deep well. Yeah, that's a good question. Do you, should you drain your, 
irrigation system in the winter. You don't need to blow out the pipes like in other northern climates where you have to evacuate the pipes with air because it doesn't get cold enough to actually freeze the ground. But it is a good idea to drain the pump. And all pumps will have, of this style, will have a drain plug right at the bottom here. And basically you just remove that plug, just unscrew it, make sure this is open so that the water, so that the air will allow the water to evacuate. And then when you're done, I always recommend to replace the plug right then because over the winter it can get rusty and it can get hard to replace. Um, so yes, I do recommend either just doing it in November or watching the weather. And if you see there's going to be a hard freeze where it's going to be in the mid to low twenties for several hours, then it's a good idea to drain the there's pump. There's no need to leave the pump plug out then. You don't need to leave the plug out over. I wouldn't, no, um, because um, over time, it, those threads get rusty yeah. and it gets hard to put them back in. So once yeah. it drains, it stays empty. Once it drains, it stays. Yes, How, unless you have an artesian spring, which I had a customer that had an artesian, their well was actually tapped into an artesian spring and it had positive pressure coming up and it was impossible. I tried to drain the pump and it was draining and draining and <laughs> after 15 minutes it was still draining <laughs> and it was, it was because they were tapped into an artesian spring that, that was actually force feeding the water up the pipe. Yeah, that was interesting. Thank you for joining me for this presentation. If you're having problems with your lawn, call me for a free consultation, 850-939-9868. I just have this passion for taking unhealthy lawns, finding out what it's going to take to make them healthy again. Father and Son has been taking care of my lawn since I installed it. I have people stop all the time and tell me I have the best lawn in Kelly Plantation. It's just incredible. So I would recommend Father and Son. As a matter of fact, people have stole my signs off the grass after you come and spray. So I think they want them for the number. I'm very happy what Father and Son does. Call me today for a free consultation to find out how I can help you with your troubled lawn. 850-939-9868.